Right now, in the autumn of 2022 in Northern Ohio, there has been a barricade constructed at Oberlin College. Now, I don't mean to alarm you with this information. The, uh, <laughs> the Cox Administrative Building has not been occupied by students. There are no fiery points positioned around mud's brutalist angles. You, you won't find any roadblocks between here and the police station. Right. Um, rather, I'm talking about the barricade uh, that's just over there, right, in the Ellen Johnson Gallery. This curious simulacrum composed of local objects and 13 artworks from the Allen collections, a barricade taken inside into a museum. Right. So interestingly enough, the conceptual motor for this piece comes from a story that evokes the opposite movement, the museum taken outside onto a barricade. So um, the, the motor of this is that famously as the King of Prussia sent soldiers in 1849 to crush an uprising in Saxony, the itinerant Russian radical Mikhail Bakunin proposed that he and his fellow insurgents place paintings from the state collections onto their barricades, reasoning that the approaching Prussian soldiers wouldn't dare risk damaging these priceless works of art. Um, so while Bakunin's vision of an art-studded barricade um, was never realized. Um, it's the inspiration behind Ahmed Alhurt's stunning installation. And I also believe it's an extraordinary site for exploring larger questions of aesthetics and insurrection. So as a scholar of revolutionary Russia, the radical past and modern European intellectual history, I'm absolutely delighted that the Allens invited me here today to talk with you a little bit about these questions of art, politics, revolution, and the barricade. So what follows, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna to try to keep it a bit shorter, but about 30, 25, 30 minutes here. Um, I'd like to work with you all to kind of crack open the larger histories that we find in barricades in general, as well as Bakunin's barricade, both the 1849 version and the 2022 version. So I'm gonna start with a few words. Oh, um, I'm gonna start with a few words about our strange protagonist, um, Mikhail Bakunin. And then I'm gonna move on then I'm gonna move on to larger questions about um, the barricade as a, a technology of insurrection, the history of barricade building in modern Europe. Um, and from here, finally, I'm gonna conclude with a few last thoughts on not just the art of the barricade, but the barricade and art, right? The barricade as a work of art, how the barricade makes us think about aesthetics in new ways. So let me begin today with a few words on our strange protagonist, Mikhail Bakunin. So some of you might be familiar with Bakunin. Um, you might have heard the name before, you might be familiar um, with this uh, famous figure from Russian radical history. Let me point out to you though now that in 1849, Bakunin was not yet the massive sort of bearded giant of European political legend. Later on, he would become this emigre prophet of revolutionary anarchism, this uncompromising anti-statist, the one-time collaborator with Karl Marx who would fall out in the 1870s, and that would lead to the dissolution of the First International. So we're not talking about this Bakunin yet. Um, the Bakunin of 1849 was still a 35-year-old young man, um, described by one scholar as, quote, a sturdy, rather dandified young giant, right? Um, he's a son of the old Russian gentry who was just coming into maturity after the political and intellectual journeys, the Vandriyara of his youth. So Bakunin was born in 1814 on the sprawling family estate. He's the son of the Russian nobility, right? A member of the gentry um, coming from Tver province, so not far from Moscow in the Russian empire. So from this old line of nobles and diplomats, Bakunin was sent as a teenager to the empire's main artillery school in St. Petersburg. Um, but there he quickly left his restless intellectual horizons pulled into Moscow in the university there, where he got enmeshed in these thorny philosophical debates in the 1830s and 1840s on left Hegelianism, all these ideas. We now know this period as the time of the birth of the Russian intelligentsia. And Bakunin was there at the very beginning as a young man. Um, he would go from there to travel and study in Berlin. And now studying abroad was kind of half taboo in these years in the Russian empire. And once his period of study was up, he did not return back to Russia, becoming an illegal emigre, hanging out in Berlin and then Paris. And he remained an illegal emigre up through the 1840s and was one in Europe when the localized revolt in Paris at the start of 1848 blew up into this large wave of revolutions across the continent. You can see some of the arrows here, the great 
trans-European revolutions of 1848-1849 um, that we call sometimes the springtime of nations, right? It's a mixture of a bourgeois revolution, a working class insurrection, and early nationalist movements against European empires. And so Akun was there for basically every point in this map that we see here, helping to arm the working class in Paris, taking part in this famous pan-Slavic Congress in Prague, and then ending up in Dresden in 1849. Now, Dresden in the spring of 1849, this is sort of the last gasp of these revolutions, right? Um, they've been slowly petering out. The, low, the loose coalition between a maturing European bourgeoisie on the one hand and the unorganized proletariat on the other was proving politically brittle and materially unsustainable. All of the national movements that were kind of swimming at this moment were beginning to shut down in the face of their inner contradictions. And all the old governments, the emperors, were tearing up the constitutions they'd given, were shutting down parliaments, were crushing uh, the armed working class, destroying barricades, right? Yet even in this twilight, Bakunin, this young man, continued to fight. Finding himself in Dresden in 1849, he used his training in the Imperial Russian Artillery Corps to provide helpful advice to the insurgents there. And he mixed in, of course, this famous story of let's take the paintings out of the museum galleries and put them on our barricade. Um, so this revolution would soon be crushed like all the rest of them, right? And Bakunin would be arrested this May, May 1849, by the Prussians and extradited by the Austrians and then extradited to Russia, his head disputed by three emperors. Um, he would eventually be transferred to the two most notorious prison fortresses of the Russian Empire, where he would lose six years of his life and all of his teeth in solitary confinement. He would only escape um, through Siberia, through exile, crossing the Pacific to San Francisco, traveling to New York and back to London at the start of the 1860s. And it's this later period where he'd become the Bakunin we all know and love today, or I, Bakunin I recommend reading, right, this um, wandering anarchist. Um, but this story that I've just told you, the life of the young Bakunin, is more of his early Bondriana, right, um, his early path to maturity. However, even in these early years, we can see in his, um, in his rapacious energies and his European travels and his early anarchist thought, the seeds of what would later become the mature Bakunin in this barricade building, right? And for me, at least, this young Bakunin energy is really exemplified in this one quote um, that comes from a work of his from around the same period. Um, in 1842, Bakunin famously stated, um, uh, the passion for destruction is also a creative passion, right? So, so thinking about that, um, Creative destruction, I feel like, works as a nice segue into larger thoughts on what is a barricade and what barricades have done in histories of revolutions. Um, so we have a barricade here in the art gallery now that's been made with the wonderful work of so many people here. Um, and this barricade comes from a long lineage of these improvised collective insurgent architecture. So what exactly is a barricade, right? When we look at its larger history, we could essentially say um, very shortly that it's a type of fortification, right? Uh, deployed in cities, a barrier built to impede movement, create firing positions and provide cover from the enemy, most often used historically during times of urban revolt. And while there's such thing actually as a planned barricade in the Paris Commune, there's a barricade commission that works to build and uh, structure Paris's barricades. In general, traditionally, Barricades have been this spontaneous, collective, bottom-up project. Unplanned moments at the start of an insurrection uh, where the people of a neighborhood, the people around you in a local district, stop what they're doing, collect out onto the street, and improvise a barricade structure from whatever might lie at hand. Um, I was reading about various accounts of barricades, um, and this is from uh, Mark Chirico's excellent insurgent barricade um, quote, Insurgents' standard practice was to scour the surrounding neighborhood in search of anything that might suit their needs. They have reported to have torn out public urinals, have hauled away bales of wool from the display in front of a draper's shop, pulled down lampposts, and removed window shutters from the walls of adjoining buildings. Home furnishings were offered by sympathetic residents or simply confiscated if cooperation was withheld. 
Books, tables, chairs, beds, armoires, and chests of drawers were frequently mentioned, but the list of materials occasionally included more unusual items, such as pianos, bathtubs, a perambulator, commodes, dead horses, and on one occasion, a blacksmith's uh, anvil. So this is really creative destruction, right? Um, the, the, the neighborhood, the space, all the thingly life of a district being torn apart and repurposed into an insurgent fortification. Um, and amidst all of this list of objects I've given you here, it's actually been the barrel that has been of the most importance. Um, barrels, I mean, we don't really use or think about barrels that much today, but a barrel is capable of being filled with heavy and dense materials, right? And then being turned on its side and moved around to whatever position it might be in, both sturdy and steady, yet mobile. Um, the ubiquity of barrels in early modern and in modern European history, as well as this mo mobility, have long made them the central element in revolutionary barricades. And in fact, the word barricade derives from the French word for barrel, right? This particular type of 59 gallon barrel used in winemaking, the uh, berry, which I'm butchering right now, I'm sure. Um, but so, yes, yeah, so, um, and so these French origins for the word for barrel, for the word for barricade, speaks to the fact that the barricade, as we know it, as we have one here today, has really its origins in French history um, more than any other. The first recorded barricade event, the day of the barricades, was in the 16th century during the French Wars of Religion, uh, barricades erected in the streets of Paris. Um, but the golden age of the barricade would really come about in 1848, 1849, Bakunin's time, right? Uh, these trans-European revolutions where improvised structures, where barricades were erected um, and out from Paris to Milan and Rome, Berlin and Dresden, Vienna and Budapest. Um, a period that was glorified in countless artworks and novels that often gives us our image of the barricade today. So that's a little kind of gloss on the history of the barricade, where it comes from. Um, but what do barricades do exactly? Why would you go ahead and grab all these barrels, grab these I mean, car parts, grab things to throw into this type of fortification? Um, so barricades most obviously do things with space, right? They do many things with space. Um, first of all, of course, is the military uh, purpose of these structures. Any fortification, be it a massive set of earthworks, a military fortress, or a small barrier thrown up in a Parisian neighborhood is a means of controlling space, is a means of controlling territory. Seizing a site, deciding who gets to enter and who gets to exit, designing firing points from which one can forcibly defend one's claim to a space. A city filled with barricades is no longer a neat, clean stage for flows, for state sovereignty, for goods, for people. Once working class neighborhoods are blocked off from the city government, from the army, from the police, um, by barricades, then who really controls these neighborhoods, right? Who is the law when the police have fled and the armed working class has blocked off an area with its barricades? To barricade off the space is to assert one's own insurgent sovereignty, to assert a local neighborhood community monopoly on violence over a corner, a street, or even a whole district or city. Highly illustrative here, I love this example. I mean, in the 19th century in Europe, often police would uh, patrol areas from police boxes. These would be these small stands held in corners of neighborhoods, usually in poor areas of the city, where they'd hang out and kind of keep a watch on things, right? And so often in barricade building, we find examples of insurgents pulling down these police boxes. The police would run away, of course, and they'd pull down the police boxes and use them in building their own barricade, right? So really illustrative of how space and control of space changes in a city site in a revolutionary moment with the building of barricades. And so to continue on this spatial thing, which I always find interesting, um, it's not just physical space or face, space envisioned in terms of force and power that is reworked by barricades. Um, often barricade structures get thrown together in this moment of sort of festival time, holiday time, right? 
So um, you're, let's say you look out your window one morning and your neighbors are building this weird structure in the street, right? You're gonna go out there and chat with them. What's going on? What are you doing building this? What, what are your political grievances? Who are we fighting against? Uh, can I give you a hand with that, right? Oh, do you wanna, do you want maybe, um, do you want some food? Do you want some lunch? Do you want a glass of wine? Do you wanna sing the Marseille? Do you wanna hang out here, right? So these barricades work in modern European history often as these really interesting social spaces where the normal rhythms and sort of um, community sites of a time are condensed around the space for barricade that pops up amidst an old city space. Um, people are brought together. So-and-so is no longer, oh, it's, it's, it's so-and-so the bootmaker, it's so-and-so the seamstress. You gather together, you build the barricade, and your comrades and partners in this larger collective social political labor. And we could say in some ways that in this fashion, just as the insurgent working class builds barricades, so too do barricades build the insurgent working class, right? So I find, I always find the social element we see here very interesting. Um, and finally, not only do barricades scramble space, they also scramble the objects and materials of our physical world. So modern cities, modern towns, of course, are these immense built environments of human material life, artificial organisms of spaces, objects, and things. And all the things of our world that surround us now, that surround us everyday life, um, do not just lurch about in jumbled chaos. They possess their own dynamics, their own logics, their own hierarchies, right? From the flow of goods from a producer, from merchant to a consumer, to the rhythms of public transportation, to the different pathways that are traveled by um, a bourgeois uh, top hat or a working person's overall, right? Everything follows certain types of rhythm and the normal workings of a city state. However, in revolutionary situations, objects and items can experience strange fates. Things are picked up and used, no longer based on the normal criteria of everyday life, of workday use, of exchange value or commodification, but rather through the strange arabesques of insurrectionary logic, which blasts normal objects outside of their normal habitats, right? Um, and so from one point of view, certainly from the view of the state, this is a crazy disordering of things, right? A, just a jumbled mess, a chaos of objects. But from the point of view of the barricade builders themselves, this isn't a disordering, but rather a reordering of objects, right? All the paraphernalia and inventory of an unequal social urban world built upon their exploitation, the furniture they couldn't afford, the pianos they couldn't play, the books and languages they couldn't read, all blasted out of their old hierarchies, co-opted by the working class and turned into this fortress guarding their own claims over their own streets. So to build this barricade is to sort of pick out objects, blast them out of their old pathways, to unalienate them, to re-enchant them, to redeem the objects of our fallen world. So that's a little bit on space. And I'd just like to share a few tiny words on time before moving to talk a bit more about our installation itself. Um, because while space is the most obvious dimension that's possessed by a barricade, we could also talk about a particular kind of connection between barricades and time, right? Because a revolution, if you begin to think about it, is in many ways kind of like a carnival or a festival, right? Um, this was a period, 19th century Europe, 1849 in Dresden, um, where we see the rise of industrial capitalism, where 11 hour, 12 hour or more work days were common for women, men, and even children, right? Um, so you're stuck in these rhythms, these labors of uh, wage labor. To suddenly, on your way to work, come across a barricade, to drop your tools, to drop the day's rhythms, and to join in, in the barricade building, to the social space in the barricade, is to faithfully interrupt your normal time and the normal time of a city, right? To engage in a carnival, in a holiday moment. Um, indeed, I've always loved there's these stories of um, People in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1840s on these barricades um, in Paris, shooting out the clocks from clock towers from their sites on barricades. And I mean, of course, you can read that as a very kind of tactical thing. In an age before um, wristwatches or pocket watches were mass producible, um, to destroy clock towers was to help protect them from the army or the police who would use them to, you know, coordinate their movements. There's also this sense that the barricade destroys time, breaks time. It gives space for new types of time rather than the time of wage labor 
in the time of the ruling classes. And in this way, I think there's, we can see the barricade as cousins to that other great technology of working class insurrection, the strike, right? And the strike does a lot of stuff with time. Okay, so those are my kind of thoughts on the barricade as certain technology. But I wanna talk with you a little bit now, not about the art of the barricade, but the barricade and art. What does it mean to think about a barricade in a museum or a barricade made out of museum pieces? How do barricades and art kind of come together in a certain way? Um, so, I'd like to start this off by thinking a little bit about the really curious conceit of this exhibit, right? Bakunin's, um, um, Bakunin's suggestion of pulling out oil paintings from a museum and placing them alongside the carts and barrels, the wood planks and paving stones of the Dresden barricades. So I spent some time these last few months trying to find exactly where the story comes from, right? This, so because it never happened, right? And paintings never made their way out to the barricade in Dresden, 1849. So why do we have this story? Um, I was able to trace it down to the memoirs of Russian radical early socialist Alexander Herzen, friend of Bakunin. Um, in volume seven of his memoirs, Herzen wrote, quote, disappearing from Prague, Bakunin appeared again as military commandant of Dresden. The former artillery officer taught the art of war to the professors, musicians, and chemists who had taken up arms and advised them to hang Raphael's Madonna and Murillo's pictures on the city walls <laughs> and with them protect themselves from the Prussians who were zu klassisch gebildet to dare to fire on Raphael, right? So here's something different. It's not a barricade, it's the city walls. We have that sort of central idea, right? Pull off Raphael's Sistine Madonna, which has been held in Dresden since the 18th century, this world classic of art um, and place it as part of a working class fortification. And from here, from this early appearance of the story, it seems to have become a bit of kind of revolutionary folklore in some ways. Um, I found in E.H. Carr in 1937 in his biography, says the story that Bakunin proposed to hang the Sistine Madonna on the barricades on the grounds that the Prussians were too cultured to fire on Raphael belongs to the world of picturesque legend, right? Um, so we can't really know if this was true or not. So if he even had this idea or invented it later, um, Bakunin is not known for his modesty or his memory, so we really can't be sure. Um, but often, often we find that as a cultural historian, historian of ideas, often the legends, the stories, the fables, the past we tell about itself have rich operative material historical existences, do things in history, have connections in history that are interesting to us um, in terms of politics, aesthetics, and the past. Um, so I was thinking about this, why might this story even be told, no matter whether it was true or not? And in some ways, it's totally this sort of bitter jab at the bourgeoisie, right? Um, 1848, 1849 had been about this fragile coalition between the rising bourgeoisie and the still kind of unconscious, unorganized working class. And the bourgeoisie would betray the working class from Paris to Dresden, uh, to Vienna, to Italy, right? And so Bakunin's um, evocation uh, that the, of a classically educated Prussian soldierly that was more concerned with grand cultural artifacts than the lives of the working class. So really kind of cynical kind of like, look, that, look how this revolution fell apart because of your values here, right? So that's one way maybe I was thinking about this. Um, but another one, I think we could dig further into the larger question of revolutionary iconoclasm picked up in this suggestion. The iconoclasm of pulling paintings off the wall of the museum and using them as fortifications. Um, in moments of radical rupture, when an old world is being toppled and a new social order begins to be born, the world of high culture, with its museum spaces, its gallery sites, the unity of cultural capital and finance capital, uh, the world of high culture often becomes the targets for revolutionaries who are seeking to build a new world and a new type of relationship between the people and art, right? So in my scholarly training, at least, I'm most familiar with the Russian Revolution of 1917, where we see this type of uh, radical iconoclasm everywhere. Um, a few brief quotes that always speak to me. Um, Supremacist painter Kazimir Malevich in 1919 wrote this piece on the museum, where he's totally, totally critiquing the institution of the bourgeois museum saying, our job is to always move towards what is new, not to live in museums. 
enough of crawling about the corridors of times past. More militant still are, are the writings of, of Vladimir Mayakovsky, who is its own giant of his own moment of uh, radical culture, right? Um, in a 1918 poem, Mayakovsky wrote, it's time for bullets to shadow the walls of museums, right? So this revolutionary iconoclasm against the museum. And each of these artists would engage in their own sort of uh, cool radical experiments with taking art out from the museum onto the street that I'd be happy to talk about with you later. So in this, I think, in this revolutionary moment, revolutionary iconoclasm in general, I think we can see this larger trend of sort of creative destruction, right? Um, um, that's held within Bakunin's 1849 plan as well. A will to pull art out of the dead museum space and place it in the streets to expropriate cultural capital of the former ruling classes and redistribute it among the people in their insurgent struggle. But okay, I'm gonna end right here and get really strange with you some last kind of thoughts on art and barricades and revolution that this moment in particular, Bakun's barricade in particular, raises for me. Um, and it's this thought of the ways in which a barricade itself can be thought of as a type of art, as a revolutionary art form, right? Um, and I'd like to do so by grounding it in one last vignette involving Bakunin in 1849. So as one might imagine, Bakunin was this weird itinerant kind of radical emigre in 1840, 1849, and he wasn't the only one doing this sort of, I don't know, hitching between revolutionary moments in Europe at this moment, right, in the mid 19th century. Um, in his travels, he crossed paths with dozens of radicals, thinkers, poets, theorists, and artists. And out of all these encounters that Bakunin had, uh, far the strangest actually took place in Dresden, and this where this suggestion was made in 1849. Here, amongst the barricades of Dresden, Bakunin met a young German composer, right? So Bakunin in Dresden barricades, there's this young German composer, and this composer would later write in his memoirs, quote, I was immediately struck by Bakunin's singular and altogether imposing personality, Everything about him was colossal, and he was full of primitive exuberance and strength. The annihilation of all civilization was the goal upon which his heart was set. I was all the more perplexed for a while in the face of such dreadful ideas by the fact that Bakunin, in other respects, proved a really amiable and even tender hearted man. So, this is in the memoirs of this young German composer with Bakunin in Dresden that you might be familiar with as Richard Wagner. Actually, so Bakunin and Wagner were hanging out together in Dresden in this moment. Um, they struck a fast yet deep friendship, constructing barricades together and organizing the revolutionary uprising in Dresden that spring. And Wagner himself just missed getting caught up to in the arrest that would seize Bakunin. Right. So this whole encounter is so weird, and I wish I had more time to get into it with you now. There's a lot to do here: history of art history of politics, history of opera, even queer history. There's this longstanding rumor, the kind of second legend of this moment that Bakunin and Wagner had this intense mutual attraction. Um, people fight over this. No one knows if it was consummated or not, but there's this really interesting, there's so much interesting going on here with a young Bakunin and a young Richard Wagner. Um, but to end right now, my last couple minutes, I would just like to briefly take these two figures and think about them as exemplars of two different currents in the history of revolutionary art, right? Um, and maybe use them to shed some final light on the fate and the larger past of revolutionary aesthetics and the barricade. Um, so I'm not sure, I know this, this isn't Wagner's barricade, it's Bakunin's barricade, but for those of you who are fans of Wagner, you might be familiar with this term, it means a total work of art. Uh, Wagner is famous for becoming the theorist of this in his operas, in his grand stagings, of, um, of, of trying to make an artwork with this will to totality, right? Where um, this organic, holistic, all-encompassing experience, right, would be bound together in a singular work of art. Um, a will to totality in the aesthetic future of the world, where old commodity forms, petty parcels, bourgeois compartmentalizations would be blasted away in this construction of a new universal human aesthetic experience, this totalizing whole, right? Um, so I was thinking about the Gesamtkunstwerk, this total kind of whole, whole idea, and the barricade and, and revolution, 
right? And I mean, Wagner and revolution, there's a really kind of uh, history about that, right? Wagner's own extremely vicious turns to anti-Semitism and nationalism going forward, as well as his reception in 20th century Germany, make it very easy to draw lines between this Gesamt Kunstwerk ideal, the young Wagner, and the pageantry of Nazism or Mussolini's total state, right? It's easy, and it's, it's, I think it's accurate many times to think of the Gesamt Kunstwerk as a fascist concept, right? Not a barricade concept. However, there's an alternate scholarly tradition which sees every revolution as having elements of Gesamt Kunstwerk thinking, of total thinking, right? To try to change the world, you need a sort of total horizon, an image of this new world that you wish to build, an alienated world, an organic unity of all things, uh, rising above the fragmented, mediated, alienated present that we live in into this healed organic totality of being. So there's some ways in which every revolution has gesamt Kunstwerk, has Wagnerian elements about it, right? Um, but at the same time, I don't think we see it in the barricade, right? I think if we want to think about the total work of art as revolutionary in some ways, that's over here, that's at one pole. The barricade, when we start thinking this way, it becomes clear the barricade is something else entirely. And there's a force field here between these two poles, right? But the barricade is very different than a total complete opera, a total complete theater pageantry performance with everything in its right place. A barricade is a jumble, a barricade is a mess. A barricade is this chaotic uh, place of fragments, never complete, never finished, right? A chaotic, irrational installation, anonymously improvised and cobbled together from the bric-a-brac, the flotsam and jetsam of the old world. And so for me at least, it's clear that setting it apart from Wagner here, thinking about this a new type of art, um, we start to ask ourselves, what does it mean then to construct barricades? You're no, this is not the romantic sort of um, uh, genius, you know, the romantic cult of genius, the romantic composer of the Wagnerian opera. This is a collective work, a fragmented work, a collage work, a montage work, right? Something brought together from all the pieces of our fallen, mutilated world. For a working class neighborhood to gather together, rip out the paving stones, peel off street signs and demarcate their own urban space in the creation of a barricade. Is this not a grand work of ad hoc collage, a creative and collaborative montage? And in this way, it's not an opera, it's not a Gesamt Kunstwerk, but the streets become a showcase for this type of montage, this type of collage, a school of militant politics, as well as a school of collective militant art. So thus for me, Akhmut Orvitz's piece, like Bakunin's fanciful suggestion, elevates the collage, the montage that blasts the normal materials of our world out of their tired orbits and reassembles them collectively in militant new constellations. The shock, the per, uh, sort of perceptive, perceptual shock one receives in witnessing high art mixed in with barrels and street signs and burnt out cars is a call to arms. A call that says that any attempt to change the world must first storm the citadels of capital, finance, and cultural alike, radically reappropriate and resignify the materials in service of success. And maybe in this way, every revolution starts with barricades and ends with Gesamt, right? Starts with this early collage work, starts with breaking apart, picking up the old pieces of our fallen world with the purpose of building a total new future instead. Maybe the barricade, maybe every revolution we can locate here in our museum in, in 1849, but between Bakunin and between Bakunin. So thank you so much.